So this is week one, and let's talk about what the heck is a robot, and what is its purpose, what does it do? Um, here we see um, many different applications for robots. You know, they're material handling, palletizing, uh, picking and placing, material removal, like having an end mill on the end of it, like sanding, painting. They're becoming everywhere. And in this post-COVID world, everyone's saying that robots are going to be a lot more in use because of the fact that in automation, because of the fact that they're reliable, they don't have sick days, and, and it allows us to, to keep things cleaner and have quality parts. Um, robots aren't taking jobs, they're creating jobs, and that's why you're in this classroom, so you can learn and be on the cutting edge of the future. Um, you know, they're here, you know, again, here's a list of stuff we just talked about. There, I, I've seen them in, in the RV industry, I've seen them, um, you know, automotive industry, you know, they're integrated with cameras or in the pharmaceutical industry, you name it, and there's a, a need for, for it somewhere. So don't just think of it as that of what we show you in this, this, this course, what you see. Know that there, there are applications that haven't been created yet that we can use these for. Material, uh, material handling is the biggest one. Um, you know, palletizing, you know, removal of material, that's the biggest one. But all these, welding is another big one. But all these are applications that we can utilize this for. Um, depending on, but some, some, let's talk about some, um, some terminology. The maximum space of the robot is if I extend things out to the maximum, uh, like the farthest reach it can go. Will it ever go that way? Probably not, but you have to take it into account. You know, so if I, you know, so if I lay down completely, you know, I can extend more than if I'm just in this area right here. And think of it that that maximum space is if I totally lay out for something, the furthest it can reach and hit. May not be operational, but it's the furthest I could hit and reach. The restricted space is where we try to keep a robot to. So that may be what's what's been guarded, or it's not past its its maximum space, but it's a space of where all the work is. It, it can be done in reality as it moves. And now op the operating space is in general the space that it works. So think of it as slowly clamping down on stuff so like so if i lay out again that's maximum space for sick this space is like this little corner right here my operating space is right here on the keyboard if that makes sense um but the number one rule for robot for for robots is the safety of the operator comes first robots can be replaced they're expensive parts can be remade but the you cannot be uh, we don't live in a world yet where we can reach, where we can replicate you. So you are the number one concern. So everything is takes that into mind, and we want to make sure that you are the next the the person that is saved. The robot is next, obviously, because it's a big piece of equipment. External devices like stack lights, you know, fixtures, um, the controller, you know, safety. That's next. Um, but, but the tooling is last because that's the thing that attaches to the end of the the uh, robot. And then the workpiece, because the workpiece is what we're we're fixing or moving. We can replace that a lot easier. But that's the this is the priority of say priority of a robotic system. Um, these are all things that you will see around this. The uh, you know mer everything. This is called the teach pendant. We'll talk about that more in a bit. There's an e-stop on it that allows you to stop everything if you think the robot is coming down on you. The dead man switch right here. That. Is going to be the thing that you're going to struggle with when we start jogging the robot because there's three positions. Um, all the way out means that hey, robot, I could be by you. Don't move. I'm not touching it, you know. So don't move because I could be by you. If I push it all the way in, um, it's saying that my arm or my muscles are cramping up because I'm being crushed or electrocuted. So robot, stop doing what you're doing. The sweet spot is in the middle, and literally, if you just let the weight of the teach pendant just kind of kind of rest on your hand, it will click into that middle position and that will allow you to move things. We'll talk about that more in class. Um, a light curtains are often used because if you enter into the light curtain, it could stop things. Safety fences, pressure mats, making sure that you're on there. Interlocks, meaning that, you know, both keys have to be turned. Warning lights, motion limits, like physical, like screws that keep the robot from moving past things. All of these are meant to keep the robot safe and, and making sure that you're not in the way of the robot when it moves. Now, there are a lot of robots that are being produced now that are called, called collaborative robots. They have extra pressure sensors and safety sensors and speed sensors in there so that if you 
run into it, it will stop. And I might share a video of that when I got a play with one at, at Fanuc headquarters. And by the way, it's pronounced Fanuc, not Fanuc. Fanuc. Um, so there you go. And I'll advance through it. But some here's some other things to think. As you go in, if you go into an area where the robot is, you always take the teach pendant or some type of e-stop device. Ideally, it's always a teach pendant. Usually, there's a safety gate with interlocks. There's usually a, 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 a barrier fence with it, and you know that's the that's there's guidelines with this with the RIA, the Robotic Institute of America. They're all on their website. You can check them out. The maximum envelope, though, is all the areas that it's going to move around to. There's the operating envelope is where we do the work. Is most robots are not going to go around all the way. Usually, we focus their attention in one area because we don't want we want cycle times to be low, so we're not making a move all over the place. Um, the teach pendant, and then there's the controller cabinet. The controller is the brain of the robot. Usually, the P teach pendant is attached to the controller cabinet, and then there's a cable that attaches to the robot that says, sends everything, okay? So setting up a safe work cell, these are things, whoops, let me go back. These are things to keep in mind as we just talk about, and the big thing is anti-tie-down logic. You know, all of us have, have been in a situation, maybe on the in the farm or something like that, where you need an extra set of hands to work on something, like maybe, and 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 we we do something unsafe to, to keep something from, to, to do things. That's what tie-down is. So a lot of times there will be like, you know, like say, say for example, the pressure sensor, you know, you may try to do that Indiana Jones thing and put some uh, something of the same weight on there so you can actually work on the robot to bypass safety. Always a bad idea. So we look for ways to have multiple safety mechanisms to keep that from happening, that you cannot bypass them all, okay? So access limits. This is one of the things you're going to look up, but we can program how far this robot can move. Um, usually, you know, we'll talk about the joints. Joints are set up in like a degrees uh, degree situation. So again, 360 degrees is, is a circle, but if I can limit, you know, it to be, and, and we won't do a full 360 degrees because which is zero, which is one, usually it's 180 to one side, and negative 180, and that equals 360. So we have a, a positive 90 or positive uh, negative 90, but this is saying that we're gonna restrict axis one, which we'll talk about in a second, to only 170 to, to uh, you know, and 170 negative. So. Um, access two would only be 60. These are all set up from the manufacturer. You can zone it in more, but then there could be some issues later on. So do this sparingly. We will do this in the class so you can see it in action. And usually you have to cycle power on the robot for those that come into place. One thing that FANUC uses is something called dual check safety uh, on their robots. It is What it does is it checks the speed of the robot and the position of the robot at, at points and creates an extra layer of safety. Um, it, it, it's a, it can be fun, it can be challenging, but it's also there for your safety. So you can see it has position checks and speed checks and Cartesian check and speed checks and other things so that with the robots moving, it won't let it happen in an unsafe way. You know, what you'll find is the, these newer robots know exactly where all of its joints are in space. And if it knows that parts of it, so say that, that we, we set up a DCS zone around here. And if I'm moving the robot and it gets there, a person could be here. Even though the work is being done on the end of arm tooling here, it knows that the robot is leaving the zone. So it stops the robot from moving anymore. That's one of the cool things about dual check safety. Or if it's moving super fast and it may exit that zone because it's got too much area to go, not enough stop, it'll stop in time before it gets out of that. So it'll do those calculations for you. You'll find DCS errors um, that happen quite a bit because they're on our robots. You know, you can see the full, and this is like our cert cart. You can see uh, the full work envelope. Here's what the DCS restricted is. So it keeps it from going out the side and everything else. So it's just another way because like if that robot turns, it could hit the wall, even though the work piece could still be doing work. You'll find that out the hard way. Um, some things to keep in mind, you know, never wear a loose item or jewelry, you know, long hair, visually inspect. And the biggest thing, though, is do not enter the work envelope of a robot that is on. We are an educational environment, so we do have some big robots, but most of our robots are small. You can get lulled into a sense of, of safety. 
and forget that this is a robot that can still hurt you. So in class, never boot the robot up in auto without me first checking it. Um, and always, 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 always be have the safety gates closed if you're moving the robot um, in automatic. When you're in manual mode or in teaching mode, we might need to get in there and look at something. Or when we start doing frames, you might need to get in there and look. That's understandable, but you need to be careful and never, ever, ever be in a robot cell longer than you need to be. Um, certain things to do, you can lock out, tag out. It, it's not intuitive on the FANA controller, but you can lock out, tag out if you need to work on a robot, good practice. Um, but in some cases, you know, you know, so like if you're replacing a servo motor, you need to lock out, tag out so no uh, electricity gets through the system. Uh, make sure any flywheels or capacitors or counterbalances or springs are loosened as well. Um, sorry. Um, program precautions when you're programming. Make sure that there's, um, you know, there's some program precautions that can take place. And there's also, and you want to make sure things are clean and motion limits protect things. So, you know, when you're programming, make sure there's handshaking going on between robots that there's external devices in to keep things safe so that you're doing, you're making the setup. So you're not going to hurt things, you or the parts. When you're keeping the robot to keep the robot safe, you know, be careful with the override speed, which we'll talk to visualize where you're going, make sure things are clean, make sure circuit protections are in place. And when you're programming, there's things called home position interference zones that we're not going to get into this class, but these are things that you can do to make sure that the robot is safe. So if one robot enters an inter uh, interference zone, it keeps another robot from entering or other things from taking place. IO signals and things like that. So here's the general robot system. We got the mechanical unit. I think it highlights. Oh, no, wrong. Mechanical unit. There's a software that runs off the controller. Um, this is the controller and there's peripheral equipment. The teach pendant is peripheral equipment. And as you see before, here's a cable going to the controller and a cable going to the teach pendant. All right. The teach pendant is how we will program the robot. It's basically like a big, giant video game controller. You will see that. Um, and, and when we program, it's, it's jog the robot to a position and hit some buttons to store where it is and how it gets there. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. Um, when it comes to a mechanical unit, how it knows its location is it utilizes servo motors, AC servo motors. That, that basically has a serial pulse counter that knows exactly where it is. So when you first turn on that robot, you know, it knows where it is because of, of the because of how many counts of the pulse that has been set it. There are absolute numbers that when it first is set up, that it knows where things are, but if you have to change it out or do things, it's different. But but it will know by as you rotate, that's how it knows the degrees, how many times it pulse around, so it knows how far the robot is. That's all set up on the back end. Um, that thing is, has, a, has an electric motor, but it also has a, mecha a, a brake. So every time that you apply, turn on, you know, turn on the servos, the brake, a brake is dropped and, and the servos are applied, the energy is, uh, supplied. So it is a mechanical system, but you got to understand that there's a brake and then a motor goes. So if any one of those things don't work, like if you don't have power and the brake disengages, your robot's going to drift. If your if your brake doesn't disengage and you're you're gonna have like you know that it's like you driving without your uh, emergency brake on in your car it's gonna cause some issues, um, so you know you need to lubricate the uh, not the servo motor itself but the, the the joints that those are all part of the PM of the robot but this is a mechanical unit that is you that is utilizing power to make your life easier. So these serial pulse encoders, there's a rotary pulse encoder, you know, and the one thing that I need to express to you right now that the robot is programmed to know where home is. There is no home unless you tell it it. Out of the box, there is an absolute zero setup where it kind of is straight on and upright. Um, that is a way for us to check to see if, if it physically knows where it is in relation to the, the software. It's a double check. It's a calibration point, but in some cases, you know, you could you can go out in industry and the robot's home or zero position is like this or something else because it's hanging upside down. So while we do stuff in the classroom where it looks like it's all zero and that's the normal set, that may not be it in the real world. Um, 
physical markings can change. So um, all those are set to do is is that when the robot wakes up or where it knows that we can have a double check to know it's there because the robots have batteries. In reality, we're going to keep the robots on at all times so it remembers where it is, but if power goes out and robots go asleep, there are in our robots, there are four C cell batteries that are in the base of the robot that when it powers down, it powers the encoder so it remains where it is so that when it wakes up, it knows exactly where it is. Otherwise, it's be like, you know, you ever fall asleep on your couch and your kid comes in and they wake you up. You're like, oh, where am I? You know, that's what the robot does. It causes an alarm if it doesn't know where it is. And so the pulse, so there are batteries in the robot that restores all that information when it powers down. So let's talk about the robot itself. Okay. This big axis around the bottom here, that's axis one. That's if you have a twisting motion. Axis two is usually right here, usually right here, kind of a bending motion. Um, at, uh, uh, no, that would be axis three. No, axis three is up here, sorry. Axis, that's the servo for one, axis two, sorry, it's more easier to see in real life. Axis two is a bending motion. Axis three is like a shoulder motion going up and down. Those are called your major axes, all right? One, two, and three are your major axes because they're their big motion types. For the most part, when the robot moves, those are the three axes of moving. Four is kind of it is kind of like a twisting motion or yaw. No, not necessarily yaw yet, but this is a twisting motion. Five is kind of a risk motion like this. And six is like, imagine if this rotates around. And with those six degrees of freedom, we can manipulate things to get wherever we need to be. Um, and so axis one, hip. Um, two, think of it as the weight bending forward. Uh, three shoulder, you know, a twist is four, wrist is five, and you'll hear it called a wrist, and six is the like the face play of the robot. Okay, as I just and then sometimes you'll have uh the robot on like a gantry or you have a turntable you can control that would be joint seven. We're not dealing with that in this class. Okay. So, you know, here's everything in reality. Um and each axis can move independently, or what makes this fun is what the robot can do calculations so they can move together and coordinate a motion. Okay. Um, you can have the rotate, you can twist and go up, down, side to side. You can articulate in any way. Um, but the big thing is, you know, the, there's the major axes and the minor axes. The major is the big motions, the minor is the small detail motions that, that have all the fun in the world if you're doing uh, uh, detail work. We do have one of these spider robots. We do not have, a. there's no joint four or joint five, but this is what that would do. This is a, a high speed uh, pick and place robot. Um, and it just moves in three dimensions and twists. Some of you might, will use that robot in class uh, just simply because um, the, the teach pendant's the same. Certain labs I'll say will move on to the other robots, but that at least allows us some more flexibility in the classroom, okay? Um, same thing here, a little bit of review. So J1, you know, you can go 100, 360 degrees, but probably won't. Um, there are hard limits, is confined by the limit switches on the, on the bottom and hard stops that, that are adjustable. Axis 2, um, again, hard stops and limit switches, but that's how it's confi confined. Same with 3, hard stops and limit switches, but moves it up and down. Four, this is software limits. It could go around and around, but sometimes you don't want it to go round and round. But this is only restricted by software motions. Uh, five is hard because if you, and it's gonna have a maximum range like this because you don't want it to bend up in itself. So there are hard there are hard stops and 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 limits um, because you can't go in on yourself like that. And then the face plate will rotate continuously 360 degrees, but you can put limits in so you don't go too far and too much around. Um, you know, you can go beyond 360, but it's usually not recommended. Sometimes when you're programming, you might need to wind something up and then wind it out or we'll hit these access limits. Okay. The controller will directly communicate everything. And this also houses the power supply, the transformers, um, memory, all that fun stuff. Um, the IO board goes through there. Um, you know, we're going to talk about that another, but that's the controller. 
you know, we have an A size controller, B size controllers for bigger applications. We have an A size controller. We have one of these open air mates. This is like, if I'm trying to save rack space, I can just put it right in a rack. Uh, makes it a lot easier. Harder to work on though, trust me. And this is the the mate controller. It's a lot smaller. It's more like what we have. The R30i A mate. Actually, this is our open air right here. Now that I'm looking at it again. Um, actually, no, it's this one. It's one of them. I think it's this one. And there's the B. We have Bs at our, our facility. I'm pretty sure. I'm almost positive with their bees. And this is, and on, there's an operating panel on the controller. Um, on the B, you know, yeah, we have a B. There's usually a fault reset, you know. So if I look here, there's nothing, we don't have these here, but there's usually a, a key that will set between teach and run, um, a fault reset, a go button, and it tells you if there's a fault or not. And that's how you turn things on. You know, but operator panels, this is where everything is at the operator panel. You know, user buttons, there's a, you know, that's where you start things, clear things, can go local or remote, all that fun jazz. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this. So, but yeah, emergency stop. The power's on because you want to make sure. And by the way, red means on because red means power or unsafe to enter. And you can see the fault LED when it turns up. Um, fault reset will help reset anything. There's also something on the teach pendant as well. But then cycle start is the you know green button that starts things when you're in automatic. And I'm just gonna advance through this. These user buttons could be something you set up. If so, if you wanted to run a macro or something, that's where you could use those buttons on the um, and then one other thing, local remote, local is for testing. This is what we're usually going to be in. Remote will allow us in production to run things off of a PLC or another controller or something along that lines. Um, so yeah, and this talks about how you set that up. I'm not going to even worry about that right now. You could also in your IO set up to run off an external IO start. That's a different class. Again, the software is all there. Um, it's preloaded. Make sure you always back up with images. We'll talk about another th another because if things go down, you're in trouble, and you got and it pays a lot of money. So this there is software, and and I would always back up with an image. Mode select. There are three modes that you can run things in. T1 mode is is, is going to limit you to uh, um, only 250 millimeters per second. T2 is a test operation mode. Um, but it, it will um, let you run up to 100% speed, but it's still in teach mode, meaning it will, you have to control it with a teach pendant. Auto mode, that's straight out the gate, go for it. Um, uh, and now keep in mind, if safety fence is a class one stop, so when it goes in auto mode, if, you're, if it's safety fence violates, servo power will be maintained for a second or two, but then it'll stop and break the robot. Um, T1, T2 will allow safety fence stuff to be bypassed because you might be in there doing stuff. So just keep that in mind. Here's what it looks like. And you can see see here. Uh, peripheral equipment, PLC, end of arm tooling, HMI. We have some HMIs directly tied into our robots for an IO simulator. Um, cameras, vision systems, we have those as well. You know. So this is some of the stuff like teach pendant. We talked about the dead man earlier. It's got to be in the middle position, but this is where we do all of our programming. Um, each app, every, every button has unique application. We'll talk about that in future classes. Um, here's some of the, the pendant, pendant keys. This is what it basically looks like. You know, when in doubt, always hit the previous button. Shift is anything that's in blue, you need to hit shift in order to execute it. So just keep that in mind. Oftentimes, and in, in uh, session one, there's a whole breakdown of all this. Menu is where you're going to get a lot of your stuff, you know, where you're going to find a lot of your, like, settings and configurations. Uh, these work as cursors up and down. If you hold down shift, think of it, and one of these buttons will, like, skip down fast. Um, step mode, this is key. You'll hit this button if you wanted to go go all the way through your job or one step at a time. I always recommend when you're first testing out, step it through. Reset, that's going to be your friend that clears up your alarm. So when in doubt, hit reset. 
I would I would know the three buttons I would know previous reset enter those are the ones you use a lot um, some of these we'll talk about in the classroom but enter you know pre previous reset enter next these soft key buttons um, position IO again some of the stuff we'll hit in other classes so I'm not gonna talk about them too much this will tell you your current position and this is how you condition to IO this is what the old controller looks like because it has display indicators right here and turns things on and off. We have a controller like this, and some robots run this. This way, our newer controllers, all the status lights are up at the top here because it's LED. So, it's just FYI. Same buttons, just maybe in a different area, so I'm just going to advance through. It's all in the PowerPoint. Um, forward, you know, forward buttons and backward buttons allow us to like run the job through the, through the commands. But when we get to class, you're going to hold down, basically you're going to turn on the robot, hit reset, hold down shift and use these buttons to jog. Simple as that. There's a teach pendant, there's the LED screen and the function keys, numeric, you know, some of this is straightforward. This is the pendant that we have. Yeah, this is more like it. All the status lights are up here. Up here. This is all touchscreen, and you can, in theory, put in a mouse and a, and a keyboard too. So just keep that all in mind. Turning on the robot, you flip a switch. In our classroom, in reality, you know, you want, you're probably not powering out too much, but that's you know, you always want to be careful. But literally, it's just turning it on. And I think that will do me for the first uh, jog speed. This is a lot of stuff. I realize I'm almost going a half hour. Um, so the jog speed, there's a percentage. Let me go back. If you can see like right here where it says 100, that's the override speed, okay? What that means is that's 100% of the allowable speed of where you're currently at. So if you're at 50%, it's gonna be the maximum, 50% of the maximum speed. So if you're in teach mode, it's since we're capped at 250 uh, millimeters, uh, millimeters per second. If you put it at 50%, 50 the fastest you're going is 125 millimeters per second. Um, there are several jog speeds, and you can even get down to a, spi a fine speed, which we'll show you when we go to zero, is a way you can literally move at one servo pulse at a time. Um, when you jog it in joint, you see these little J2, J1s. Uh, on the teach pendant, you hold down shift and hit these buttons and it's going to go positive or negative. And you can see where like, uh, you know, that's literally what it does. You find out which axis you want, hold down shift, and we'll do this in the classroom. Um, you know, you can join, you know, we're only going to use joint mode when we are um, getting out of jams you know, because it allows you to move one joint at a time. It's a, it's a, you know, you might use it to reconfigure the robot if you want to go from a certain way, um, you know, move, moves the TCP, which in, in an arc, not in a straight line. That's what you got to be careful of, which we'll cover later classes. There are five different coordinate systems and you toggle between them by hitting the, the cord button. So there's joint, which moves every in, things individually. World will be in the XYZ direction, which we'll talk about. Tool will move in relation to tool the tool um, the tool center point. User is something that we define, and then the jaw frame I never use, but it's there. Okay, and coordinate you know on the older thing, hit cord. There's a light that'll show you which one you're in. Um, if I'm in a, you know Cartesian, this is what it's doing. You know, remember in math x and y, and there's a point. It's all relative to the zero. So I, you know, everything moves in relation to a zero point. Same thing in a three dimensional, I can have all three of these things and I can move in relation to an origin. When we're in a Cartesian um, jogging system, what we, you know, in world, uh, they call it, you know, world, in joint, everything moves in an arc and linear, there's an origin in the center of the robot and it moves everything in relation to the, the tool center point um, in a, a way or two from that origin in the center of the robot. 
So that's, and you can see the origin of the, of the world frame is right here at the, where the J1 and J2 intersect. So, and right hand rule is the tricked out gangster. So X, Y, Z, um, as you can see right there. So you hold up your right hand, you know, your, your, your pointer finger is X, your thumb is Y and uh, your thumb is Z and then the Y is, is pointing out. If you put that behind the robot and if you hit the jaw in the X positive direction, it's going to go this way, in and out. If you do it the Y, it's going to go this way. And if you do the Z, it goes up or down. That's why you got to know your orientation because you're literally moving that, that tool center point um, away from the origin in a positive X, positive Z, or positive Y direction. Okay? Um, and you can see how it restores things. These, these calculations are based upon measurements from the origin, which you'll never see. Okay? And that's what it's demonstrating right now. And you can signify position and joint, world, a user, user we'll get to next week. Okay? One other thing to keep in mind is singularity. If things get too straight, there's too many ways it can go. And if you need to fix it, you will need to get in the joint and, and jog the J5 axis kind of down 15 degrees or up 15 degrees. That will get you out of the singularity. Okay? And that's what it says. So, so in singularity, not in singularity. Just go to joint 5 and jog it down a little bit. I, I, I post a video on this soon. Okay, and it said, yeah, joint five plus or minus 10 degrees. And that's all we're going to do because I'm not going to go into tool frame this week. So I just wanted to talk about some stuff Probably went too far, but this is, gives you enough to know. All right. Have a good day, and I hope this was helpful.